but Stephen is going to present their collaborative um, research on psychology and new media to us now. Welcome, Stephen. And the work that we uh, embarked on was largely based on Carlos's reading initially of uh, uh, some papers by Gordon Pask uh, dating back to 1959. Gordon Pask was a, a very famous cyberneticist, um, and he was very interested in um, so-called self-organizing electrochemical systems for a brief period of time in his life. He jumped his back and forth between many different topics during the course of his lifespan. Very, very prolific writer um, and worked at many different universities. He was uh, from England. Um, so what uh, Gordon Pass did back in the 1950s was he got what he called was an organic computer. Um, and this is at a time when the, the rise of the digital computer hadn't yet uh, peaked. And he was exploring other means of computation. So in particular, he was interested in analog computation. And so what you're seeing here is a picture from one of his papers of what he called dendritic growth uh, within uh, basically a, a bath of ferrous sulfate, uh, which is basically uh, a bath of uh, iron and salt. And uh, what happens when you pl apply the mild electrical current uh, through such a bath, you put one electrode on one side of the bath and one electrode on the other side of the bath, and you start to get growth of things that are very similar to what uh, Rob and Laura Lee actually presented, uh, diffuse limited aggregation. Uh, what was also interesting about what you reported was that he could actually train the system based on inputs. Uh, that is, if he basically decided uh, a specific current would, would reward the system, then the system would grow, and it, and, and it was selective in terms of what, what, where it would grow to. So this immediately interested me when Carlos told me about this. Uh, we, at the time, we were both uh, working in the same lab laboratory at Simon Fraser University uh, in Surrey. I was doing a postdoc there. He was working on his PhD thesis. And we then embarked on trying to replicate uh, Gordon Pass's work, initially just trying to get uh, growth within a medium um, and basically to explore the, the potential of Paskin like systems. Um, we wanted to uh, look at the computational possibilities of natural processes and also reestablish a dialogue uh, related to cybernetics, mainstream neuroscience, and the arts. And also uh, investigate alternative models of electronic arts practice. So I'll show you basically a video of our very first experiment. Uh, which is basically me uh, messing around with hydrochloric acid in my home, um, which I don't recommend to anyone. Uh, but this is a, 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 a solution of hydrochloric acid in, in, in tin chloride. Okay, and we continue to work with tin chloride for the rest of our experiments, but we uh, abandoned hydrochloric acid pretty quick. Um, so this is a time lapse. It's actually 10 times speed, and what we what we're doing here is just simply passing electrical current, mild electrical current. I think it was uh, 200 millivolts um, uh, through this valve. Now, what this reminded me the first time I saw it. Um, was basically of dendrites and of neurons and all those things that I've been studying for most of my lifespan. Um, and specifically, the, this growth process, the growth processes reminded me a lot of work uh, done by Donald Hebb, which I will talk about in a moment. Okay, so that was the first experiment. Um, we next uh, moved away from hydrochloric acid, as I mentioned, it's not the safest thing to work with. So we went to a mixture of ethanol 
and tin chloride. And this shows you the growth pattern that you can get from passing a, an electrical current through a solution of uh, tin chloride and ethanol. Uh, again, very mild current, uh, low voltage. Um, in fact, this was actually uh, based on uh, voltage that was acquired from me just speaking into a microphone. And so basically you can see this growth pattern emerge as a result of the sound input. Um, and then the project evolved from there. We wanted to explore just how, how, we, could, how, how we could build this system and maybe uh, build analogies related to the history of neuroscience as well. Um, what we found working with alcohol in solution, as you probably know, is that 100% ethanol will evaporate really quickly. So we next moved to basically a closed system. We created a plexiglass chamber where we placed electrodes through holes in the plexiglass chamber. And the plexiglass chamber itself was filled with tin chloride solution made with, mixed with ethanol. And then when we passed electrical current through it, we got these nice dendritic branching patterns. We then complicated things substantially. And um, basically, this is when we started to call our project Biopoesis, which is basically the title of this work. Biopoesis is basically a word which uh, roughly means the process of life arising from uh, non-living matter. Uh, because we felt that what we were observing, although it was inorganic matter and non-biological, uh, had many biological-like qualities to it. And, and we wanted to explore this dichotomy that exists between the organic and the inorganic and the biological and the non-biological. And so we created a very a much more complex system for our next experiments, uh, where we had basically a, a chamber filled with tin chloride and we had electrodes basically placed inside the, the chamber and we, we fed stimuli from the environment. So let, let's say a room like this, we would capture sound through a microphone like what I'm speaking in. And we would feed that into the solution through the multiple electrode array. And then we would basically allow the solution to, the, the voltage to pass, pass through the solution and then back out through a set of speakers, thus modifying the environment and there, thereby creating a feedback loop. Uh, that is, the, the sound that was going into the chamber was causing growth. The growth was causing a change in the sound in the environment, and this would basically create, create this uh, feedback loop that caused growth. And this is basically the, what the chamber looked like, the, the first one we worked with. And again, this is, we started working with glass because um, we found that plexiglass was impossible to clean after we used it once, so we moved to glass as, as the chamber. And this is the growth that we, we saw as a result of uh, passing uh, this sort of this loopiness of, of sound through soundscape through the through the chamber. And um, what was quite interesting about this was basically the, the the how unpredictable it was, how indeterminate it was, and how unpredictable the upcoming sound was as a result of that indeterminacy. And so we we next. Um, wanted to explore the possibility of there being, since these growth patterns look a lot like the dendrites that you see growing up of neurons, we wanted to uh, explore some of the work uh, uh, done by Donald Hebb, a famous Canadian psychologist, um, who basically proposed that, uh, proposed one of the first early theories uh, of how information is stored in the nervous system. Uh, what you're seeing here is basically a picture of uh, dendrite uh, axons terminating on a cell and basically any inactive axons would basically ungrow, they would basically retract from a cell as a result of a lack of activity. So according to Hebb, when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B and repeatedly or persistently take part in firing, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. So this is basically what one of the first proposals uh, that was made in the history of neuroscience uh, that, to explain how information might be stored at the level of the synapse in the, between neurons. And so we created a more complex system for our next set of experiments, which ended up being our final experiments. And, and 
I want to talk a little bit just briefly about why they were our final experiments. They were our final experiments not because we've lost interest in the topic itself or lost interest in the experiments, but because there were practical reasons. And I'll get into those in a moment. Um, and if you have any questions about those practical reasons, I'd be happy to answer them as well. So we set up uh, an installation uh, at a variety of locations, one at SIGGRAPH uh, back in 2012, and one at Isaiah, the International Society for Electronic Arts back in 2012, where we basically had uh, motion detection algorithms and cameras situated around the gallery space that would collect information, motion information, from anyone visiting the gallery and in the center of the gallery space was the actual tank that was filled with the tin chloride solution. And so we would feed, on the one hand, um, basically uh, information about motion in the, in the environment into the tank. And we would also feed information about various frequencies of sound into the tank. And each different electrode corresponded to a different place within the gallery space. And each of the different anodes or cathodes basically corresponded to one particular frequency of sound. And so what we were looking for here was basically, um, what, what would happen is if, if you had sound detection if, in a particular, of a particular frequency, it would open the gates to one of the anodes. And if you had motion detection of a particular, in a particular location in the, in the gallery, it would open one of the cathodes, thus opening the circuit thus causing growth, and thus causing basically an associative process as we, as we call it, okay? So um, this is basically a, a picture of the setup prior to any growth in, at SIGGRAPH in 2012. And um, this shows you what happened over the course of uh, the time that we were in that gallery space. We ran that exhibit for four days and what was quite remarkable about that exhibit was that we, well, first of all, we actually at one point had an opera singer come by and was singing the opera uh, to try to get to this thing to grow right in front of him. It was actually quite, quite remarkable to see it happen. Uh, but more importantly, what we noticed is that when there was a lack of activity in the gallery space at, at, after, after the gallery closed, for example, the growth retracted and the dendrites went back into solution. So this was an activity dependent process, which is very similar to the, the activity dependent processes that had, had postulated in his, in his works back in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, so what you see happening here is basically a, a situation whereby you have an association being formed between sounds and motion in, a in the gallery space that is activity dependent. When there's a lack of motion, when there's a lack of correlated sound, the dendrites go back into solution. And I'll show you uh, basically an example of that. I have a video of uh, a little mag... Uh, So this basically will show you the growth uh, from one of the associations that, that's being formed between one of the electrodes and the motion two electrodes. And this is time lapse, so this basically shows you what's happening over the course of uh, one day. Okay? Now, that's interesting in itself, but what I wanted to show you was the actual activity dependency of this. So basically, um, this shows you uh, another video where we see growth, but we also see the growth disappear. We, said we see dendr dendritic growth basically disappear and then reappear in different locations as a function of what is going on in the gallery space. So you'll see that some of these branches will just basically go back into solution, like right here this is disappearing, it's going back into solution and then later forming again, okay, as, 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 as there's more sound and motion in the gallery space. Now the reason we lost interest in this, or so to speak lost interest in this, was more of a practical reason. Um, ethanol is a solvent, as you know, that is, it is it's basically very good at, at dissolving uh, salts, and that was why we used it to dissolve the tin chloride. It's also very good at dissolving glue. 
And so the, 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 the chambers that we made, which were made out of glass, were held together by various glues. And so um, over the course of three to four days, we found ourselves constantly having to re-glue and reseal these, the, this, this chamber. Otherwise, we were losing alcohol, to the, and we would come back in the morning with the alcohol spilling out on the floor. So it was not a very practical installation piece. Um, and it, it took a lot of work for us to maintain it. And so we, we, we kind of lost hope um, of, of pursuing it. And recently, I've been just staring at this chamber, which sits in my office now, and dying to, to re, renew this project. And the way I see to renew this project is actually create a chamber where that is completely sealed. That is, it's uh, maybe a solid piece of acrylic that has electrodes going in and has a sealed containment of tin chloride solution. So in, in summary, I just wanted to um, basically express my gratitude to, again, the, the, the organizers of this event and uh, to Carlos uh, himself for being an inspiration for this piece um, and also for all the work that he put into this piece along with, along, along with the work that I did as well. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask. That's yeah. So glass is very appealing to me as opposed to acrylic because uh, with tin chloride solution, when it when it basically um, when it creates the dendrites, they basically stick they, they stick the static to to the surface of acrylic, and they're very difficult to remove. So glass is a much more appealing substance for me to, to, to consider. That's something I consider. If, if, there's, if there's a glass blower in here, uh, I'd love to meet you. Um, um, and I'd love to pay you. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's great. Yeah, so the, the, the suggestion there was to actually speak to some glass blowers down in Grand Isle, and that's a very good suggestion. There was a glass blower presented as one of the last curiosity. Yeah, we know a glass blower. Oh, you do? Okay. Great. Sorry, but then you had a question. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, what is the mapping between the input signals and the nature of the growth? Well, the, 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 the growth was in a direction, so basically if you looked at the, at the actual piece, if you saw an association forming, you would see growth between one anode and, and another cathode. So if there was association between a particular frequency of sound and a particular location in, in the gallery space, you would see longer dendritic spines going in that direction. So that's the mapping that you would see. So why are they just a single line and a Because the, the system itself is, is inherently chaotic um, and it is, it is largely indeterminate and is based on the principles of what Rob was speaking about. That is, these dendritic spines basically are being formed by an apparatus again. Uh, diffusion limited aggregation and disaggregation, I guess, as well. Yeah. Yes? Oh, what am I working on now? Uh, so we, we left this behind and we started getting very interested in, in microbial fuel cells. So that's actually a project that we've been working on and we, we actually presented on last uh, summer uh, uh, at an event that Laura Lee helped organize. Uh, it was part of Isaiah, yeah. But two, so two summers ago, I guess, yeah, 2015. Um, so that was the project that Carlos and I worked on together after that. Um, so we were basically interested in what sound, uh, what voltages can be produced by bacteria and microorganisms, uh, because they do create, they create an electrical gradient in the environments that they're in. So we basically had an installation piece uh, down near Stanley Park where we had electrodes basically plugged right into the mud, which is packed with uh, bacteria and basically sonified that, um, that the microbacterial activity in the mud. 
Uh, yes, our, 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 I believe that Carlos posted the audio for that on the dprime.org website, and I think you have it. Undulating sound. Yeah. We can share on our Facebook page. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So the question was basically whether I spoke to any geologists because dendritic formations also occur within rock formations as well as they occur within uh, neuro within neurons and astrocytes and glial cells. And no, no, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be very interesting to do that. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much.